Trio, Structured Concurrency for Python. Before we talk about concurrency and Trio and all of that stuff, uh, let's go into a little bit of history. Back at the dawn of time when dinosaurs roamed the Earth and I was very, very young, there was a control flow uh, uh, mechanism called GoTo. And GoTo was the way you uh, went from one place to another in your software. Um, here is a language called BASIC. Uh, it's the first programming language I ever used. And it is uh, it's not widely used today. Um, it was very popular in the uh, 70s and early 80s. Uh, and here is a BASIC program. It's a very simple, straightforward BASIC program. It just counts from one to 10 and prints out a line with each of those numbers on it. And then it prints all done when it's finished. And to prove to you that it works, here is the output. Um, I apologize for the quality of the Commodore 64 screen. It is an old cathode ray tube. And um, <clears throat> downscaling it on the slides doesn't seem to work all that well. But you can. You can see, and if you want to, you can make sure that the program that's running is, in fact, the one that I have nicely syntax highlighted above. <clears throat> so the way this works is that um, on line 40, you check if your loop variable i is less than or equal to 10. You go to line 20. But there's no, other than the number next to the go to, there's no actual link. So you the only time you know that line 20 is a place that your program can jump to is when you get to line 40 and read the go to. But this is a very simple program. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. It's only five lines long. So let's look at a more complicated one. This is a program. It has three go to's in it. So it's not actually all that complex by programming control flow uh, standards. But um, I'd be willing to bet that very few people in here can actually read and understand that program without drawing diagrams or stepping through it or executing it or whatever. Uh, I know that I certainly can't, and I'm the person who wrote this program. Uh, what it does, as you can tell by the uh, input prompt at the top, is it prints out some number of primes. So let's run it with uh, printing out the first 10 primes. And there you go. Uh, if somebody wants to confirm that those are, in fact, prime numbers. Um, <clears throat> now, this program has three go-tos in it. They all jump to different places. And it's, it's a mess. It's a very simple algorithm. It basically has uh, three nested loops in it, but nobody's going to follow that easily. Um, fortunately, we were rescued from GoTo by the invention of structured programming, which I'm a little young to have lived through that. It happened around the time I was busy learning what buttons on a keyboard did. And uh, in modern languages, we don't use go to. We use for and while and if, and we have nice blocks. Python has particularly nicely visible blocks. So the first program I wrote and I had in basic there that printed out 10 lines, here's the equivalent in Python. Much easier to follow, no go to's. You can tell that uh, the, the indented print is the thing that happens. Uh, in the loop, and the all done happens at the end. And you can tell immediately where the bit that repeats starts and ends. And here is the equivalent of the prime numbers uh, program. It's still complicated. It's not that easy to follow. But at least you can tell where the loops are. And you know that the stuff at the beginning, before the while, is stuff that isn't uh, going to repeat, and the stuff inside the while is the outer loop, and then there's a, an inner loop, and 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as an aside, one of my favorite little bits about this program is the else block on the end of a for. Uh, you can do that with while loops as well. And anything in that else block runs after the loop, but only if you don't break out of the loop. So if, uh, that runs for prime numbers because we haven't broken out of the loop. It doesn't run if you break out of the loop. So um, it's, a, it's a neat way of knowing whether your for loop ended successfully or if it broke. Um, else is a really, really horrible uh, word to use there, though, um, which is probably why this uh, construct isn't used more often. Um, uh, if anyone wants, I can switch from sharing the presentation to sharing a terminal window and run these programs to prove that they are actually the equivalents. But uh, we can maybe do that later because switching the presentation stuff is a bit tedious and annoying. Uh, so getting rid of GoTo didn't just give us um, nice execution flow that humans can reason about. It did a whole lot more than that. Um, it let us have call stacks and local variables in our functions. And the reason for that is that GoTo doesn't just jump around inside a function. It can jump to anywhere in the code. So you can jump from the middle of one function to the middle of a completely different function. And if you can do that, then you can't reliably, you can't rely on local variables because they may not have been set. You've got all the ones from the previous function instead of the new function. Uh, you, your call stack doesn't make sense anymore because you're now in a function that was never called. Uh, so getting rid of goto lets you have these things. You can have exceptions and nice error handling because now you've got call stacks. You can unwind them. You can jump to your uh, caller. You can you can wrap a, a try except around some nested piece of code and catch any error that handles ins that uh, happens inside it. And something that uh, Python does particularly well is that you can have context managers and with blocks. So with open file name as file, uh, you can open a file for the duration of a block. And then no matter how you leave that block, whether it's by reaching the end of it or raising an exception or anything else, you'll, get, you'll be guaranteed that when your program flow leaves that block, the file will be closed. And you can do this with anything. So that's all all these wonderful things you can get just by not having go to anymore. So that's some history. And uh, the first the part of this uh, the name of this talk is uh, concurrency. We've talked about structured in the history lesson, and now let's talk about concurrency. So what is concurrency? Here are some words that spring to mind when somebody mentions concurrency. I can throw in a few more. Uh, race conditions, um, philosophers with strange habits in cutlery, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things are associated with uh, concurrency, but they're not actually what concurrency is. So at its core, Concurrency is having multiple independent flows of execution. So instead of having one flow of execution through your program, where you go from line 10 to line 20 to line 30 to line 40, and then jumping back to line 20, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you can have multiple of those happening maybe at the same time, maybe uh, switching between them, maybe interleaved the ordering of those things doesn't matter because they're independent. They can happen in any order. And the thing that makes it interesting and difficult is having communication between those flows of execution. Because if they don't talk to each other or know about each other, they may as well be different programs running on different computers in different cities doing different things that don't know or care about each other at all. Technically, my program running and your program running are concurrent systems, but they're completely disconnected from each other, so it doesn't matter. 
when you've got communication, it gets interesting and useful and also difficult. So concurrency has its own go-to, which we use uh, a lot. Uh, I'm going to call it spawn. Different languages call it different things. Um, the one, the name that's closest to go to is the language Go, which calls its spawn uh, primitive Go. Uh, but having Go and go to and Go is a very common word, so it's confusing to talk about. So I'll stick with spawn. Uh, this is Erlang, which is a language from the 80s. So about 10, 15, maybe 20 years after basic with its go-to. Um, don't worry too much about the syntax. You're not expected to uh, read and understand this program at a glance. But there are two main parts to this program. The first bit, which is now highlighted, is a recursive function which um, every time through the loop, it prints out a message and then sleeps for 200 milliseconds and then uh, prints out the next message. It counts downwards rather than upwards, like the basic program did, just because it's easier to do that with recursion and a little less code. Uh, adding a few lines, I could make it print forwards instead, but that's just extra complexity. And then the thing that makes it concurrent is in the main uh, function here, we spawn it once with task one as the message, and then we spawn it a second time with task two as the message, and then we just wait for them to finish. So I will actually uh, switch the, the presentation thing and run this. Um, if I can find the right window. There it is. So here is that Erlang program running. And maybe it's running a little fast. Uh, let me just make that instead of 200 milliseconds, let's make it 1,000, and let's make that sleep for six seconds. So there we have it, both tasks running, counting down simultaneously, and at the end, we finish. Async.io, which is the standard library concurrency async framework for Python, uh, calls it create task instead of spawn. So here's a, the previous, the equivalent of the uh, Erlang program written using async.io. We have the function that prints the message every 200 milliseconds, uh, sleeping in between. And we have the main function, which spawns two tasks um, and runs them concurrently. Uh, but it doesn't just spawn the, the two tasks. It, uh, oh, hey, I can see my mouse cursor here. It first runs the function once, kind of synchronously, so waits for that to finish. Um, and then it spawns two tasks in parallel. So these two things will happen at the same time, but only after this one is finished. Um, but the important thing here is that a task is just an object that can be passed around. And there's no link between the place the task is created and where it starts running and um, where you wait for it. So you can have things that go, get lost and go missing and tasks that get orphaned. So here is... Um, one of the big problems with async programming, in Python especially, but in pretty much any async uh, system, where do errors go? So we have a an asynchronous function that waits for a little bit and then throws an exception, and we call it in three different ways. So the first one 
we call create task, we assign it to a variable, and then we just never wait for it. So the error from this task, just nothing ever catches it. There's nowhere else in the program for it to go because we never wait for it to finish. So the error for this one will get lost. Um, what Python does is when the task object gets garbage collected, which can happen at some arbitrary time in the, the future, um, we'll get a runtime error that gets logged. And if you're not looking at your logs, well, you don't know. Uh, it's not even an error. It's a warning. We just don't know what happens with it. The second one, um, we create a task, and we do await on it, but only later. So it raises its error. The error just sits there waiting in the task object. And then when we await it right at the end of the program, then we get the error, and then it gets raised. But again, there's no link between where the task is created and where we wait for it. So if we create this task in some deeply nested, complicated piece of code, none of that shows up in the stack trace. The only thing that shows up in the stack trace is the function that uh, raised the error and the main, which uh, called the await. It's a little more complicated than that, but basically, Stack traces are very confusing and often have the wrong things in them um, when you're dealing with async exceptions. And the only one that actually makes any sense is this one where we create the task and immediately await it. But if we're going to do that, we may as well not create the task at all. We may as well just um, await raise error because we're not doing anything uh, concurrently there. We're just running, uh, sequentially running stuff in another task. So this is one of the big problems, not the only problem with uh, async stuff, but one of the big ones that's kind of equivalent to some of the problems we saw with GoTo, where you can't do proper error handling and there's no way to know where your uh, control flow came to at any point in the code. Um, so this brings us to structured concurrency, which I'm not going to have an example here because that's what the next section of the talk is for. But the core idea in structured concurrency is that any task that's spawned in a block of code must finish in that same block of code. So there's no way to spawn a task and then move on to do something else, and your program's somewhere completely um, hidden away or in a completely different part of the program when your um, errors happen or when your tasks finish. Uh, so this is one idea. It's a very simple idea, but it's very powerful. It's the same kind of idea that you get from go to uh, not being able to jump from the middle of one function to the middle of another function. So the advantages of structured concurrency, as we'll see, is first you get execution flow that humans can reason about, the same as with GoTo. We can now see what our code is doing. We know where all the uh, uh, concurrent tasks are happening. We can have nested contexts and task local state. So that's kind of like having a call stack and local variables, only with concurrency. So I can spawn a a task, and then that task can spawn its own tasks. And the the uh, my spawn task will wait until its tasks are all finished before it finishes. And everything is nicely ordered and structured, and there is always somewhere for errors to go. And we always know what state our, our program is in. Uh, which brings us to well-defined cancellation and error handling. So if you have, if one of your subtasks uh, raises an exception which isn't caught, well, that bubbles up to the, the uh, block that spawned it, and then everything inside that block gets canceled um, because that's what happens. If you get an error, your, uh, your block stops, and then you get that exception raised. Um, more more detail on that 
in a bit. Um, but most importantly, no orphan tasks or missing results. So you never have code that just goes on forever and everything's lost track of it and nobody knows what it's doing. And it could be doing anything. So the third part of the, the title uh, of this talk is Trio, which is the framework we'll be using, which Trio is built on the ideas of structured concurrency. So the best way to learn about Trio is to read the documentation. So I think we're done here. You can all go off and read the documentation, and um, everything will be great. Um, the docs are actually excellent, so you could just go and do that. That's what I did. But since we still have a few minutes left of this talk, um, I'll, I will actually talk about Trio some more. So brief um, intro to async programming. You've got async code that can call sync code, um, but don't call anything that blocks. And sync code can't call async code. Sync and async sound way too similar when I'm saying them. But anyway, synchronous code can't call async code uh, unless you're writing a framework like Trio or async.io, and then there's some special mechanisms to make that work. Um, so here are some ways you can get uh, async code wrong. Um, the first is to try and await something in a sync function, uh, and that you'll know immediately because the compiler gives you a syntax error. Uh, you're not going to miss that in your code. The other thing you can get wrong is to forget to await an async code. Uh, so here we have, uh, we're calling an async function, but we're not using await. And thus, you get a runtime warning logged, and you you don't get, well, what you actually get printed there is the representation of a coroutine object. Um, but, uh, that's kind of an implementation detail. And this is unfortunately a symptom of um, the concurrency primitive in Python is basically spawn. And we're building the structure on top of spawn. So it's the same as building your for loops and while loops and if blocks and whatever on top of go to. If go to is still there under the hood, while you can get some of the benefits of not having go to, you can't get all of them. You can't trust that there won't be some code somewhere that uses go to and breaks everything. Um, but Trio does provide some tools for debugging stuff. I'm not going to talk about uh, trio.abc.instrument anymore in this talk, but it is incredibly useful, and the docs explain how to use it. So if you find yourself with code that seems to be doing weird stuff, um, it might be a good starting point for debugging. So how does Trio actually do the structured concurrency? Um, the main thing here is it's called a nursery. So instead of having uh, the equivalent of async.io.create task, which you can call anywhere. The only way to create a, a background task is to use a nursery. So this code, as before, we have our uh, task function that just prints a message n times. Um, and in our main function here, instead of using uh, create task, we use nursery.start soon. And we have this um, async block uh, with the nursery. So async with open nursery as nursery. And what that does is um, any task started by this nursery uh, will cause the, the block to, to block, basically. The block doesn't end until all the subtasks are finished. So you'll notice we never await anything in this block. But both tasks, uh, well, task one will print its four lines. Task two will print its two lines. Uh, both of them will finish before we leave this block and get to the all done. Um, 
and to answer Bruce's uh, question, because this is a good time for it, um, if you want to have uh, separate uh, sort of overlapping lifespans for uh, tasks, um, the way you can get that is a nursery is an object. You can pass a nursery into a subtask. So if you want to have um, a task that's allowed to create sort of sibling tasks, uh, you can pass the nursery to that task. And it can create tasks that outlive itself, but they don't outlive the nursery. But there it's explicit. You can't do that without explicitly passing the nursery to your subtask. So there, there's a mechanism for it, but it, your, life, your lifetime of your, your tasks is still limited. You can't outlive the parent. It's just you can you can pass the parents around and create, uh, you can have your subtasks create sort of siblings instead of their own children. Um, I don't really have an example for that though, but it, it's straightforward enough to, to figure out if you play with it. Um, a really nice consequence of this is timeouts. Uh, if anyone has ever tried to have a timeout on an HTTP request, um, you will understand the pain. Uh, there are multiple different kinds of timeouts. Are you talking about a connection timeout? So you'll stop trying if you haven't made a network connection within some amount of time. But once the connection's made, well, the the server can take three hours to uh, send your response, and you just have to sit and wait. Or maybe you have a timeout on the server or the amount of time between data being received, it gets really complicated. And what if you want to run three, uh, make three requests sequentially and have a timeout for all of them? Well, you have to now figure out how long the first uh, request took and subtract that from your timeout, et cetera. Really, really uh, nasty. Uh, with Trio, you use the uh, async block. So you've got um, the first thing, uh, first bit of code here is trio.move on after with three seconds. So the entire uh, body of that block will um, take at most three seconds. So here we've got four seconds worth of stuff. Um, we uh, go to sleep, we wait a little bit, we print still sleeping, we wait a little bit, and then we wake up on our own. Um, after three seconds, that block will be canceled. Um, and because it says move on after, uh, we don't care about that. We, we don't care that it didn't finish, we just care that it didn't take too long. So no exception will be raised, we'll just move on. Um, if I put my focus on the correct place, I can move on. The next one uh, is fail after, which is the same as move on, except instead of just moving on, it actually fails. So we, uh, this example also has a nursery. Um, because the nursery is inside the, the timeout block, um, the, the timeout applies to all the subtasks and the body of the nursery. And because we use fail, we get an exception um, if we take too long. So this simplifies timeouts immensely. All you need to worry about is how long do I want this block of code to take at most? And um, then you can do whatever you like inside that and be guaranteed that your, your entire block won't take longer than that. Um, and I mentioned uh, things being canceled. So the timeout is kind of a special case of um, errors and cancellation. So cancellation is basically killing a task. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that under the hood. There are checkpoints where uh, Trio as a framework gets to um, pass bits of code, well, gets to raise exceptions and stuff. Basically, any time you call a function 
in the trio namespace or an async function in the trio namespace, there's a checkpoint inside there where things can be canceled. Um, if you're just writing code that uses trio, all you need to worry about is as long as you're not CPU bound and as long as you're awaiting something in the trio namespace somewhere in your pull chain, um, your stuff can be canceled. Um, but um, anytime you've got an exception in any of your subtasks, um, an exception, uh, that exception sort of bubbles up. And whenever it gets to a nursery, all tasks inside that nursery are also canceled. Um, and then you can catch exceptions as normal um, around a, a nursery. Uh, Trio does also handle the case where multiple tasks raise exceptions simultaneously, um, which is also a little more complicated than will fit on one slide, but the docs do a really good job of uh, explaining that. And in general, you don't need to worry about that too much unless you're doing multiple different things uh, concurrently in a nursery. And Trio also comes with a whole lot of other features. So it's got um, task local storage, like thread local storage, um, except for tasks. Uh, it's got mechanisms for communicating between tasks. So events and channels are the main ways of uh, using communication. Um, but there are also lower level things, locks, semaphores, et cetera, et cetera, um, there if you need them. Um, you can use asynchronous generators, but because of the way they interact with the low level sort of spawn level stuff in Python, you have to be really careful with those. So it's probably best to avoid them um, if you really uh, need to, unless you really need them, and then be careful. Um, you can use threads if you must, and that's actually the title of the uh, section of the documentation that explain, that uh, uh, talks about them, threads if you must. Um, you can have async file system operations, which is really difficult to do because kernels generally don't provide good tools for them. Uh, Trio cheats and basically just wraps synchronous file system operations in uh, threads under the hood. But it's a good idea to use those to avoid maybe blocking for 30 seconds if you have a very busy disk or something. Um, you can have subprocesses, all the good things that uh, any async uh, framework provides. Um, so in conclusion, uh, what have we learned so far? Firstly, we've learned that GoTo is bad, but hopefully we already knew this. Uh, and in fact, if Python is our language of choice, uh, we don't even get GoTo. It's never been in the language. Um, just like GoTo, spawn is bad, no matter how you spell it. And uh, structured concurrency is great. Um, Hopefully, I've given you enough of a taste of it that you, you're you interested in trying it out. And uh, if so, you should definitely use Trio for your next ASIC project. Um, personal anecdote, uh, we have a system that talks to Let's Encrypt uh, to manage certificates for a cluster. And that's built with Twisted because we built it like uh, five years ago. And it worked great until uh, Let's Encrypt um, retired their version 1 API, and the library we were using didn't support version 2. And it was quicker and easier to learn Trio and re-implement the whole system in Trio from scratch than it was to try and update the library to use the slightly different V2 API. Um, and deploy a new version of the thing we already had. So Trio is great. And that's the end.